Uh, welcome, dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. We are continuing our study on the revelation of St. John the Divine. Today, we are concluding the seven letters to the churches from our Lord Jesus Christ. We are on Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, the church in Laodicea. And we hear today our Lord's words warning a congregation of Christians then and today and always regarding the temptations to live contentedly, uh, to seek the pleasures and desires of the world, rather than to enjoy the riches of our Lord Jesus Christ, which are imperishable, which the discipline and troubles of this world cannot take away. So we pray the work of the Holy Spirit enlighten our hearts and minds, and that we treasure this word that our Lord has set before us. As we hear the revelation to St. John, uh, we are uh, instructed regarding the, the general flow of revelation that in the midst of the temptations and trials that the church faces, we hear plainly about those in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, that the Lord is with his church. He has not abandoned her. In fact, because of his death and resurrection and his ascension to the Father's right hand, the church has a steadfast position which nothing can take away. The seas may foam and the mountains may tumble into the sea. There will be social unrest, economic and political stress upon all peoples, and even Christians will face this. But our Lord remains with his people. The Father, as often is said, remains upon his throne. There will be trials that will come upon the church, and they will test the church. But the, the Lord has given his word that we are to hold fast and to continue to pray, come Lord Jesus. We know that Babylon, the powers of this world, will eventually fall. We have heard the promise in the Old Testament several times and seen this with the witnesses, Egypt, Assyria, uh, Babylonia, and other great powers of the world that the devil and uh, the beast are using. But in the end, Babylon does fall. The Lord Jesus Christ is the conqueror, and we participate in that victory. And he brings his new city, the new creation, in which righteousness dwells. Uh, so that is the general flow of the book of Revelation. Uh, today in chapter 3, we are going to read verses uh, 14 through 21. Awesome, brother. If you would now please lead us in prayer. And thank you so much for covering our technical <laughs> difficulties. And then I'll pick it up and we'll dive in. I will do so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Gracious Father, in your Son, Christ Jesus, you have set before us all the treasures you have given us. His life, his death, his ascension, for we are seated with him already in the heavenly realms. And these treasures are imperishable. So let us hold fast to these treasures, setting aside the pleasures and riches of this world, to hold fast to what is true and genuine. Although we may be tested to what is right and just in this present world by the tribulations and sorrows, you have proven yourself faithful in every way. You have vindicated your son and set him at your right hand. And therefore, those who hold fast to his word likewise will receive such an inheritance. For we are co-heirs with him. Grant us this endurance and perseverance through your son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. Well, again, just yet another apology and a quick explanation for folks. So as you know, I'm out here in uh, Minnesota, Laverne, Minnesota, actually. Uh, my name's Pastor Phil Boo, if we've not talked before. And uh, I connect to the studios down in St. Louis through the Internet. And the Internet is an amazing invention when it works. Sometimes it doesn't. So while I was connected to them, they couldn't hear me, but I could hear you. It was a real mess. But we are back on now, and I really am grateful, brother. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping, though, that we'd like normally start the show with, and then we'll jump back in. Is that all right with you, okay? Very good. All right, here we go, then. Uh, well, do allow me officially, then, folks, to thank again my guests for carrying the torch while we were having our problems. But um, today is Tuesday, October 1st. 
And if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm sure you have. You're listening to the program where we, each weekday morning, explore the Holy Scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. Our brother already explained our text, right? We're going to be in Revelation chapter 3, the second half. We're picking up from yesterday, which was pre-recorded, and um, we are now diving into Laodicea. So the Lord is addressing this church in Laodicea, reproving them for their lukewarm faith. And I think this is fascinating. Uh, I'm sure our, our brother will expand on this a lot in a moment. But this whole idea of being neither hot nor cold, this lukewarmness, is something I hope we get into today more. But he advises them to seek true wisdom and healing from him. He stands at the door and knocks. A, a verse that I was very familiar with growing up, but it's going to be interesting to see how we unpack it in the context of Revelation. Let me drop the name of the sponsor because we just love them so much. It's the uh, Lutheran Heritage Foundation, right? They support um, all types of missions around the world through their translation and publication and distribution services of resources at no cost. Uh, Christian resources, Reformation resources, help people deepen their faith by partnering with lhfmissions.org. Whether it's around the globe or just down the street, you can learn more at lhfmissions.org. Okay, and then I just want to throw out the email address, and then we'll jump back in. Thy strong word at KFUO is how you reach out to me. All right, brother. Well, uh, folks, this is the Reverend Stuart Crown. He's the pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Palto, Palo Alto, California. You've already started the prayer. You've already touched on the text again. Let's, uh, let's get into it now even more in earnest, if you don't mind. Um, I'm just going to read the first few verses, and then uh, I'll hand it back over to you. So we'll be in Revelation chapter 3 in the ESV, starting with verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. All right, brother, whatever background uh, you want to continue to provide for us, and then dig into this for us, this idea of hot and cold, and is there a reason why he's using this imagery for Laodicea? Oh, yes, there is. Uh, Laodicea is, was a prosperous city about 90 miles east of Ephesus, so the people of Laodicea and Ephesus would have been aware of each other, and that does have some later importance. Uh, but the issue of being hot and cold, let's jump into that right away. I think mm -hmm. we would understand hot being zealous and cold being sort of uh, not very responsive, sort of uh, uh, giving the cold shoulder, we might say. I'm not quite sure that actually would explain that Jesus would want his people to be either hot or cold. Maybe hot, mm -hmm. yes, but why would you want them to have a coldness to the Lord, to the church in general. So the context, the historical context, probably provides the best explanation. So uh, Laodicea did not have the, the best setting. It was put in place because of the roads, not because of water sources. So it had to pipe in its water, both hot water and cold water. Now, for us who live in hotter climes, we love the cold water in the summer. So cold water, of course, would be refreshing. And if you live near hot springs, like Hot Springs, Arkansas, or the baths in, uh, in England or Baden-Baden in Germany, hot water would be, of course, refreshing. It would uh, sort of relieve the aches and pains of the body. So uh, the people of Laodicea are neither hot nor cold. They don't provide refreshment they're not refreshing in the communion of the church, either to provide care for the body or uh, refreshment for the, uh, for the soul, uh, like snow or cold water on a hot day. So that's probably why the Lord refers to the people as neither hot nor cold, but tepid. So if you make tea, you probably don't want cold tea unless it's iced tea. <laughs> um, right. And if you want hot tea, right, you want hot tea. But tepid tea, you probably don't want in your mouth. And so when the Lord speaks about spewing them out, it's more than just sort of spitting. Uh, it's more like a vomiting. It's just rejecting what the, the works are. Uh, 
they might have some appearance of conforming themselves to a, a righteous life, but they're they're neither hot nor cold. You know, when I was growing up, this was a very troublesome passage for me for the same reasons that you're explaining here. Jesus says, he seems to say, that I would rather you be hot or cold, but not lukewarm. And, and you're absolutely right. I think our confusion comes in if we start to think that hot is good and cold is bad. Um, as in hot is very useful, like you said, hot springs. Um, you talked about hot springs, Arkansas. There's a, there's a hot springs in North Carolina, too, town of the same name. And in the same situation, right? They have all these wonderful healing hot springs. And so I guess that makes sense. And they're having to actually uh, pipe in their water, as you said, from Hierapolis. So it's lukewarm by the time it gets to the city. So they would have known those things. But, yeah, it's that cold one, though, that always struggled with me because I was raised to believe that hot is on fire for Jesus and cold is, you know, wet fish. You don't care. You have no passion for it. But it sounds like what you're saying, and, and I agree, and others have said, too, that in this case, no, it's probably talking about, say, like the cold water from the nearby city of Colossa. Colossa, you know, you know, yes. It's situated between this place where it has this healing hot water and these refreshing cool waters, but because of their situation, yeah, they're getting lukewarm water, which isn't fun to drink. So yeah, hot and cold is good. Like, be cold for Jesus. Be refreshing. Proclaim <laughs> the gospel. Uh, that's how I would put it. Maybe look at it a little differently, but that's how I res- reason that. You know, the hot is good, cold is good, but it's the lukewarmness that doesn't make any sense. So I see this as yes, a positive I, thing. Yeah, I probably wouldn't say, let's be cold for Jesus. But yeah, that would need some explanation, of course. Uh, well, only because he, we've already received the explanation about what it means to be hot and on fire hot. for Jesus. I, I think yes. being hot is miserable. If you are down south, <laughs> oh, you're hot. It's burning up in here. Um, I think we've uh, come to, a, a, to believe that on fire for Jesus is this great image because it's energetic and passionate and it recalls the Holy Spirit and all kinds of other good things. But I think being cold for Jesus could catch on. It's not <laughs> more of a gospel way of looking at it. But anyway. Yes, I mean, that image is used in Proverbs 25, uh, mm-hmm. that, that the person who brings the message for the, uh, uh, the, the master he brings refreshment to that person's spirit. Yeah, the, the cold, the cold water from Mount Hermon is refreshing. The snow on Mount Hermon is refreshing on a on a hot day. Now, it is true that there are some people noted to be zealous for the zealous in the spirit, like Apollos in Acts eighteen. And uh, Paul encourages us to be zealous, uh, fervent in spirit, hot in spirit, in Romans twelve. So they're lukewarm. Um, if you take it my way, then, you know, they're, they're nothing useful, not to be refreshing, not to be uh, uh, um, healing like the hot springs. But, yeah, they're just lukewarm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he talks about how when he's talking to all the churches. He's often giving them the things that they're doing right and then the things that they're doing wrong, kind of almost a reverse law gospel. He, he butters them up at the beginning. But for Laodicea, it seems like he starts right off with the with the bad. There, there kind of is no lead up of here's all the great things uh, about you. Um, you think they were in a position that's a little worse off than some of the others? What are your thoughts behind why he starts off a little differently in this revelation? All seven letters have fundamentally the same outline. There's the introduction of our Lord's person. And then the commendation or the reprobation given to the congregation, uh, the promise at the, at the very end, and then he who has ears, let him hear. And so the congregation is waiting for maybe the same sort of pattern for them, having read it or having sure. heard. And now they, uh, the, con- the, the lack of commendation is all the stronger because there is no positive word said to them at all. Uh, so I, I think that the challenge for the congregation is, having heard this word, is there in fact any hope for them? Are they going to be so devastated? Are they going to be so rebuked by the Lord that there is no possibility of recovery? And of course, that is not true because he is disciplining them because he loves them. And he is, in fact, at the door, as we would say, as he says, knock, 
He does want to come into them for fellowship to renew their lives. Mm. Well, we're definitely going to get into that after the break in a few minutes, because this whole knocking at the door is another verse that was frequently used out of context in my experience growing up. Uh, but we'll get to that uh, for sure in a minute. Yeah, just sort of lingering a little bit then still over this. If we talk about being lukewarm, like even if we kind of disagree on the hot and cold imagery, we do all sort of get what he's saying when being lukewarm, riding the fence. You know, there's all kinds of uh, different sort of uh, uh, little uh, cliches that we use to talk about being uncommitted. Uh, what does that speak to us today, brother? Right? Like, what are some areas of, I guess, spiritual complacency that you see among either your parishioners or just uh, Christians out in the world? I mean, obviously, the unbelievers are complacent, but even among believers, I think this is this is a message to believers, not unbelievers. And then we must be um, useful for the Lord. What do you think? Well, there is a many admonitions from our Lord Jesus Christ regarding the proper use of temporal resources. We have the, the passage in Matthew 6 regarding anxiety over our present riches, the, necess the necessities of daily bread. And Paul's admonition to the Philippians in chapter 4, or his personal account in chapter 4, of how he's learned to be content with what he presently has. So yeah, here's maybe an image that our listeners will understand uh, better than just my words. I use a, a catechism series called Divine Drama. And there is one of the illustrations is called a sin thermometer. And the top of the sin thermometer is a man with a, a weapon. And of course, fifth commandment, that looks very dangerous. He looks like he's about to sin. And then a little lower on this so-called sin thermometer is a man with dollar signs in his eyes grabbing money. And both of those we can recognize as sin obvious, the covetousness. But on the bottom of the sin thermometer, there's a, an individual that's loafing about on a sofa watching TV. And do we count that laziness, slothfulness, uh, contentedness, aiming for our own pleasure as sin? And that would be the lukewarmness that we see here in, the, in this congregation. Uh, you know, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, if we have food and clothing with these, will we, be, we will be content. And the Laodiceans seem to be striving for more than simple food and clothing. They're looking to pile up the riches to build another barn using our Lord's uh, parable imagery. Uh, so if their riches are in that extra barn, as it were, that's where their heart is and not with the Lord himself. Whenever we look at ourselves, then, it's important that we remember that that usefulness aspect seems to be what you're getting at here, that we are useful for the Lord, that we use the gifts that he's given us, not just to kind of store up, but to share with others. And that really is the Christian, I guess, the Christian difference. When you look out in the world, plenty of people come together to help each other, whether they're believers or not. Uh, we see this going on in uh, my neck of the woods, where I'm from, Asheville, North Carolina, and the western part of North Carolina, who have been tragically hit by this most recent um, hurricane, really Katrina level for them. And, um, you know, people are coming together, and, and we see that every time that there is some sort of natural disaster or some sort of a horrible thing that people are going through together, neighbor helps out neighbor. So what do we make sense of that? For the, for the non-Christians, it's pretty easy. God writes the law on our hearts. We don't, none of us do a good job of recognizing it, but we all kind of recognize somewhere deep down while, even, even though it's clouded by sin, we recognize that we need to help out each other, and people do. But believers, you really see them, because they've now come to terms with their purpose in life is to help others, uh, yeah, they really do come together in even more dramatic ways. So you see God working amongst us. Just imagine, though, if people were to be useless, right, to be lukewarm, to not care about their neighbor, to not care enough about God to even serve their neighbor. Um, I think those are kinds of things that must have been going on in the church in Laodicea. And maybe not even the temporal riches alone, but as Paul would say from 1 Corinthians 12, the spiritual gifts which they have, 
use or receive from the Lord. Maybe also those are not being employed within the congregation. They see themselves rich only in the temporal sense and not in the eternal sense with the gifts of the Spirit. So while they might possibly be helping those in the community and even sharing their, their wealth with other people on occasion, they show their poverty, they show their lukewarmness by, by not vocationally serving within the congregations. They're just sort of content with their ordinary lives and doing the ordinary things of, of charity, not, not devoted, not storing up, not doing the good riches, which show that they have a, the riches stored up for, for eternal life. Indeed. Well, we are going to look at more about what exactly was going on on the ground with them as he continues his admonition of the Church of Laodicea. Let's add a few more verses, starting with 17. For you say, Jesus says, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I know it's just one verse, and he's going to counter that with where they should find true riches. But doesn't that verse kind of reveal a little bit about what their mindset was? They were obviously a prosperous people. And how often is it that when we are blessed, when we have material blessings, I guess I should say, that we just tend to start putting our trust in those things rather than God, the the creature, so to speak, rather than the creator? You know, there is a, um, a note of self-sufficiency that our Lord is addressing here. And as you noted there, the Lord is looking at their, their present economic and well, present economic prosperity. He seems to be referring to their, their three, the three uh, pillars of their uh, temporal success of being a medical center with ISAV, of being a banking center, banking center, uh, in, regarding poor, and then also with the uh, the naked, that they were known for their particular wool, known through the Mediterranean region. So he's aiming at their the core of their prosperity, of why anybody would have looked to the city of Laodicea and the, and the inhabitants. We're going to look at a little more about what was going on and how God responds to their desire to be self-sufficient when we return from these messages. So, folks, don't go anywhere. We'll try to settle up a little bit of this technical difficulty while you're away. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word, and I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Stuart Crown, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Palo Alto, California. As we jump back into the discussion, remember that if anything today, as we're talking, catches your interest or raises a question, we'd love to hear from you. You can email me at thystrongword at kfuo.org, or you can find me on Facebook or X. But either way, send me an email, and we'll try to get your question or your comment out on the air. Okay, well, brother, let's head back to the text. Uh, we got some of those technical difficulties worked out, uh, at least for the moment. So uh, heading back then just to where we left off, you were talking about this illusion of self-sufficiency. I guess just talk a little bit more about that before we move in. This, I guess this idea that the church um, you know, was thinking that they just needed themselves. What, what's that about? 
Well, if the church, in fact, takes the Lord's Prayer seriously, our Father who art in heaven, and give us this day our daily bread, these individuals, these Christians, as well as us today, will, would acknowledge that God as creator is the one who provides for all that we, provides all that we have. And Luther does, of course, an excellent job in the first article of the Apostles' Creed and also in the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer, the explanations, listing to begin to list all that the Lord provides for us. And it is then our duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. It seems that the Laodiceans and even us in our sufficiency don't always recognize uh, what we have received and therefore don't respond in a faithful manner. That is acknowledging what he has given and then putting to good use what he has given. A bit like the, uh, the servants who have received from the master who goes on a long trip, they are to use fully what he has given to them. Uh, the one who would receive five earns five more. The one who had two uh, earned two more. But sometimes we, we may be fearful of judgment, may, may be fearful of what the Lord has given to us, uh, what he expects, and we just um, hide it away, which is not exactly what the Laodiceans were facing. Uh, they were just facing just storing it, maybe on the shelf, as it were, not even concerned about interest um, so, you know, a lot of churches. Uh, the, well, sorry, I didn't mean to interject. Um, but no, a lot of churches, they uh, they struggle with how to deal with money, and and I think that's pretty fair. Jesus didn't shy away from talking about the money. The Bible talks about using our uh, even financial gifts for for His cause and for His glory, and He is certainly is the the source of even those temporal gifts. But you know, churches, you, you talk about interest, which is certainly uh, connects back to Jesus's parable, this idea that at least then it's still growing funds and resources for the for the kingdom. But I think we have churches today that struggle with um, this fear of shrinking attendance numbers and other things. And they say, well, I don't want to come off this money. We want to we want to squirrel it away for the future. And and some of that is being a good steward. But obviously there's the danger of, of not trusting in the Lord. On the other hand, a church might respond by saying, well, uh, we're going to just spend all our money every week. <laughs> uh, it wasn't this, uh -huh. in this church, but when I was growing up, uh, the church I was married at, actually, a Bible missionary Baptist church down in North Carolina, um, it, uh, they would post their, um, their giving. It was a small church, but whatever was given one Sunday, they'd pay the pastor with some of it. They would make sure the rest went into the community and they made sure they had zero dollars at the end of the day. So the LCMS was a little bit like this. We used to once decry things like a fire insurance, what we might call property insurance today, uh, because it was not trusting God. So talk a little bit, whether it's a church, a synod, or even an individual or a family, um, it is hard a little bit, right? To walk that balance between both being good stewards of God's gifts and also not clinging to it as a source of, of hope and comfort. Yes, our Lord does speak to this quite bluntly in Luke chapter 16 regarding the stewardship of that which is little, uh, the temporal riches, and then not being uh, worthy, that being uh, not being faithful with that which is eternal. So while we rejoice in what God gives to us, the blessings of this present age, receiving them with prayer and thanksgiving, uh, they are reflective of how we regard God's word. Uh, that is, if we are focused upon the simple, the management of our temporal resources, uh, we have uh, turned away from the management of the eternal. Uh, what I mean by that is, when our Lord speaks by the Holy Spirit, or when David speaks by the Holy Spirit in Psalm uh, 19, that his word is to be desired more than gold. And we are to be uh, managing that word most of all. So the Laodiceans uh, were not at fault, if you were, for managing temporal resources, but only for man managing temporal resources and not for hearing the word, knowing that they were to be rich in Christ Jesus, knowing that the banquet that he provided for them, the, the spiritual insight that he had given to them, to know those riches which the banking industry could not provide, uh, the clothing which Christ's righteousness is, which their wool could not provide, and the um, again the riches which 
are um, are sealed to us by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, the earthquakes and, and famines, whatever Laodicea might have faced, could not take any of those promises of Christ away. I think that's a really good point to make, is that the issue wasn't that they happened to be wealthy, but that their concern and focus was all about maintaining and controlling that wealth. That and, and that's good for us to remember too, because so I have a stewardship Sunday coming up, <laughs> October thirteenth. Uh, by the way, the text of the lectionary work out perfect for it. But uh, I'm not a big fan of stewardship Sundays. I'll be honest. Uh, I think stewardship is something that should just be integrated through all of our teaching and 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 um, preaching. But uh, of course, a day is not going to hurt anybody. We have LW Mail Sunday coming up this weekend, so look forward to wearing my purple clerical but in any case um so we don't mind bringing uh, highlighting these aspects of christian life that's not the reason why i don't like it the reason i don't like stewardship sundays is because they're often very law-based which again nothing wrong with that but they're law-based about you know money <laughs> uh and we've tried to supplement that with uh you know what, what we call it uh, time talent and treasure we, we try to supplement the other ways but even time talent and treasure this idea that we can contribute to God and be good stewards of all types of things he gives us ignores the very good point you just made, which is we are also given the word better than no matter what talents we have and, and no matter how much money we have, no matter even no matter what, how much free time we have, all the gifts of God pale in comparison to the word. So we have this word that we're also supposed to use properly, and yet we do. Don't we concern ourselves over having stewardship Sundays on how to donate and better spend money? But, yeah, the word is something that we've often not been good stewards of. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I agree that uh, this evening we are having a, a board of stewardship meeting to discuss our upcoming 2025 budget. And the congregation is – is content with her temporal welfare. Uh, but having that, there seems to be sometimes a little lukewarmness, to use our Lord's words, regarding the pursuit of those treasures which cannot perish. Right. Uh, not to say too much personally about the congregation, but we all, as the Lord says to these Christians, uh, the daily repentance to to die to the old man's desires, be raised up by the Holy Spirit to hold fast what cannot perish, what cannot be taken away. You know, I'm reminded of uh, Luther's mighty fortress. They can take our wives, our children, our goods, our fame, whatever it might be, but the word they cannot take away. So that word will remain with us, and that's what we we hold fast. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't want you to share the uh, or breach the privacy of your congregation, but I imagine that even if you were to be extremely explicit about all the things you struggle with, this would be something that every congregation and even every person does. I, I feel like we sometimes think if we have all this money, we'd be able to do so much good work for the kingdom. But the truth is, we have plenty of money. Just go do the work now. Oh, you don't have any money? Well, so much of the work for the kingdom is absolutely free of charge to do. So, yeah, right, I, I think the money's important. Is easily we, spread. Yes. Yeah, we focus on money. It's important, and we should, but I agree with you. As we struggle with budgets, it's a little hard sometimes to keep focused, uh, as apparently the Laodiceans were not, that there is yet another thing we're supposed to be good stewards of, and really it is free of charge. So let's look at uh, the next section then, because Jesus – then revealing himself in this way to John, uh, counsels them, <laughs> tells them, uh, admonishes them uh, using the same analogy. So I'm going to pick it up back with 17 again and read through 19. Again, for you say, Jesus accuses, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may be, uh, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. So Jesus says, using that same, you know, you guys want wealth, well, get your wealth from me. 
but obviously that's true spiritual wealth. Sure, this is uh, much like what we hear from Isaiah the prophet in chapter 55. He's not counseling them to empty their bank accounts and buy the word from Jesus by salvation. He's saying, look at where the, what the source is. And if the source is in the bank, if the source is in the fields, if the source is in the ISAV, you know how easily those things can perish. But who am I? Uh, I'm the source. I'm the amen. I'm the one vindicated in the resurrection. So if there is a source of life, if there's a source of hope, if there's a source of insight of eternal riches, it won't be downtown. It will be in my death, resurrection, and ascension. I'm the one sitting at the Father's right hand. And you can speak about all, all what your riches have gained for you. But I know of what I speak. I'm the faithful witness. And whatever happens, the world doesn't change what God has said. That's the firm anchor that you need to, to look at. Um, and so the, the counsel is, I'm your source. Acquire from me. My for me, it's all free. He's using their language, turning it back upon themselves, as you noted, uh, from that accusing, for you say, now to, I counsel you to buy from me. A great reversal that our Lord uses here. He does use this this reversal. I, I love it. He talks about, you know, they're, they're, you're concerned with temporal riches. Let me give you spiritual riches. But he, he also plays into the, the analogy that he's been giving, this gold refined by fire. You already mentioned, you know, the, the purpose of gold is wealth. That refining, though, I, I think that's a little interesting in light of our conversation earlier about cold and hot. Because in this case, fire is now really reflecting uh, the trials and, and the tribulations that Christians often go through, that God leads us through, that, of course, then refines our faith. So, it, yeah, so even being on fire for the Lord sometimes means having to endure the heat of people's criticisms and persecutions. But then, of course, there's white garments, uh, and then discipline makes sense. The ISAB, though, I just wanted to highlight that because— uh, the Laodiceans apparently, you know, I didn't know this. I just read this somewhere, but they were pretty well known for their medicinal salve. So that, the reason why salve stands out here, because we get gold, white garments, discipline, but why I salve? Well, on the one, so they could not be spiritually blind. We get that. But yeah, apparently they were known for their eye salve. So I'm, I'm just trying to think like if you were in a congregation um, that's mostly farmers. You're going to use farming analysis, uh, analogies. If you're in a congregation of, mm -hmm. of of business people, you're going to use maybe corporate analogies. Uh, and, and so, yeah, Jesus is like, hey, you guys like ISAB, right? You guys are known for your ISAB. You probably made a lot of money off that ISAB. Well, I even have ISAB that's better than yours. I, I just love <laughs> it. It takes some humility, though, on their part. Yeah, so that Laodicea was in the Lycus Valley, I would make a comparison as the pastor to this congregation being in Silicon Valley with Stanford Medical School just uh, about a mile and a half away, world-renowned in, in many areas of medicine. And then also all the investment banking going on with the tech industry that we, we are in physically, economically, a very similar situation to the congregation Laodicea. And uh, noting that refinement by fire um, – not that the congregations in Bithynia and Pontus were all that far away. Uh, Peter writes to them in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter uses a similar image of being refined, um, the fire refining them, the, the tribulations. And maybe there is a sort of this, this veiled allusion to what other congregations are enduring. Uh, you too may have the goal, but it will come by being refined. Uh, as the other congregations have endured. And looking ahead in the rest of the letter, we certainly can see some of the possibilities that the this congregation and the others would have faced. Let's add this next section then. Because he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he will be with me, or he'll eat with me, I should say. 
Uh, this passage to me was one I heard so often growing up in an Arme- Arminian, not Armenian, an Arminian tradition. I grew up in a decision theology tradition that said that Jesus is constantly at the door of everybody's heart knocking or through the gospel, depending on which flavor you get to. And all you have to do, <laughs> and you love it when it comes to salvation and it's like all you have to do, but all you have to do is open the door. And you open the door by um, saying the sinner's prayer, confessing your sins. Jesus comes in your heart. Now he's, you know, hanging out in your heart with you, and things are all going to be good. Um, I get where they get the imagery. Obviously, Jesus is here, standing at the door. He's knocking. We have those famous pictures of Jesus knocking at the door, those paintings. Um, Unpack this for us in the way that John intends it, in the way that Jesus means it, in the way that the Bible wants us to know. I, I know this doesn't have anything to do with decision theology, so what does it mean when Jesus says, I'm standing at the door and knocking? Well, so often we can treat that first word, behold, as sort of this, just this uh, rhetorical device, but it's actually quite significant. He's saying, really pay attention, Christians, hearing my voice. This is important. Set down everything you're doing and just have your ears tuned to me. Everything else put away. Just listen very carefully. I stand at the door and knock. That's probably this eschatological, this last time, this imminent, if you will, visit. That he's not saying, well, you have 15, 20, 30 years. It's the next generation. It's 40 generations from now. I'm talking to you presently, and this is important for you and this congregation right now. So... It signals his his patience with them that he's at the door and he's knocking. He hasn't walked away. So there's the opportunity that he has given to them. Uh, we may remember from Second Peter 3 or, or Romans 2 that God's kindness, uh, his patience is being revealed in these circumstances. He doesn't overthrow them immediately. Uh, he has given them warning an opportunity to repent. So this is not about evangelism, not about decision theology. This is a congregation, a a child, that needs to listen quite earnestly to the Father and to know the consequences if one does not hear the Father's voice and continues to rebel. There will be consequences if they do not hear. So it's still very appropriate to say that this is a personal and intimate invitation from Jesus. I think where we go astray, though, is to say that this is to someone who does not believe inviting them to give their hearts over or to believe. You know, there's a it's, sort of it, a common yeah. – se- oh, go ahead. Go ahead. But it's very clear that he's talking to these particular Christians. Right. He's not talking to the nations. He's talking to this congregation. In mm. fact uh, – to the pastor himself also. I I don't think that we can exclude the pastor as if the pastor is above the context of the congregation. He may be be involved in the very same situations, the same circumstances. He's been living, uh, I don't know if this works with visit uh, hearers anymore, high in the hog um, (laughs) with the rest of the congregation. And he too has become desensitized He's become a lotus eater. He's become content and not not realized his duty to call the congregation to repentance because he is not either. Well, first of all, I hope that illustration works for folks, but maybe it doesn't work anymore because the best part of the pig comes from the belly now. That's the bacon. So. Yes. Uh, yeah, higher on the hog, the better the meat. Yeah, so he's – I get that. The pastor is involved. The people are involved. So this is an intimate invitation from Jesus. It sounds like you agree with that, but you would not maybe go so far as to say that the practical application for this is to everyone, open your heart to Christ's knock. What I was going to say earlier is that in the Lutheran Church, you know, I've observed it both as an outsider and an insider, and um, I I notice the kids, and I have studied catechetics, and uh, one of the things I don't care for in our church is the rite of confirmation. All right, so everybody write, that's thy strong word at kfuo.org. But I don't I don't really care for the rite of confirmation uh, because A, it's not very biblical, and, and B, um, it ends up being this graduation. I'm not, I'm not spilling the beans. Everybody knows this in their churches. They struggle with it. 
Catechesis, on the other hand, is a lifelong endeavor for the Christian, and making that little formal in a young person's life, nothing wrong with it. And confirmation as a right, nothing wrong with it either. But to me, again, as an outsider, it seems like that's when Lutherans give their heart to Jesus. You know, the, our, our Baptist friends, you know, and other non-denoms and others who say, well, you know, one just needs to give their heart to Jesus as a, as a dedication of their life to Christ. Um, that's essentially what we're asking them to do. We're asking them to confirm the faith given to them in their baptism, that the tone, the, 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 the focus is obviously better, but it's still kind of the same practice. So I just wonder then, as someone who kind of habitually is looking for ways to uh, improve catechesis and confirmation, if this if this message is kind of like the the confirmation moment, right? You've been saved. You aren't unbelievers. You're believers, and I'm showing you in my love for you by not abandoning you in your lukewarmness. But now I'm standing at the nar- na- door, knocking, seeking for you to repent. I mean, that's a message for all Christians, is it not? I would relate this to how Paul addresses the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 mm-hmm. when he does not have praise for them regarding the practice of the Holy Communion. And he's instructing them, he's calling them back to the Lord's words. So he doesn't continue to chastise, he puts the gospel before them, which I think is why our Lord does address the, uh, the Laodiceans in his opening words. Uh, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I am the source. The source of your life won't be found, again, in in banking or anything else that your hands or mouth or your medical school will be able to accomplish. Uh, My life, my death was vindicated by the Lord raising me from the grave. Therefore, I am trustworthy. My words are true. I went through this. You know where the source of life is. So why would you pursue anything else? So I'm here. And we we might think that John is calling upon the imagery from John 10, that Jesus Mm -hmm. is himself the door. I mean, mixing sort of the metaphors a little bit. But he wants to return to them and be at the Holy Supper once again. Come in to him. Um, I mean, there's the, both the, the personal admonishment to him, but also the congregational admonishment. He's standing at the congregation's door by the pastor's preaching. I love it. I love it. Well, we have a few more verses then to get under our belt before we wrap things up today. Verses 21 and 22, we'll finish up chapter 3. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You mentioned this earlier, but he begins in the same way he always has. He has, of course, his identity of who he is. Instead of going into the things of doing good, he just goes right into their lukewarm works, uh, the fact that they rely on their own riches. But then he points to them uh, the true riches that come from being in him. He invites them to repent, and he hangs around at the door waiting for them to. He loves them. And then he says to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit. This isn't the only place the Bible speaks in this way a couple of other places. Um, it must make us Lutherans a little uncomfortable, right? Because it seems like the actor in the conquering is you. So help us understand what Jesus means when he says the one who conquers. Um, our, our, our salvation, our ability to sit with him on, uh, on his throne isn't related to our works, is it? How would we better understand this? So before you were on the air because of the technical difficulties, I noted how this was connected somewhat to possibly connected to the um, Ephesian congregation in, oh. in chapter 6, that the victory comes through the armament of the Lord, and that's how you're able to stand firm. So I would relate it to that. You don't go into battle naked. You may have all of the temporal resources that you have to enter the world's workplace, but you're still naked in regard to fending off evil attacks. So if you're clothed properly with Christ's righteousness, if you have insight given by his Holy Spirit, as Paul prayed for the Ephesians in chapter 1, you are then able to conquer. You're conquering because you are a co-heir with Christ Jesus. The language that Paul uses in Ephesians 2, I think, is a good uh, parallel here, that you've been made alive, 
You've been raised and already seated with him, already seated with him in the heavenly realms. So hold fast to that, and that's how you conquer. Uh, I, I do think that we have some reservations using because it's using this because it sounds like we're the active ones. We are in Christ, right. and it is God who uh, both wills and works in us according to his good pleasure. So work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who wills and works in you. Uh, because, therefore. So that because, therefore, then, we have this understanding that Christ is the one working through us. We have his gifts, and we are the one conquering. And I guess that's the part maybe we miss, because we are the ones conquering. Yeah, it's not our effort that, con that conquers, um, but rather we are, are given the victory, but then we actually literally are the ones who conquer sin, death, and Satan. Um, yes, it's a gift from Jesus, but it would be like saying, uh, I got you uh, as a gift some tickets to the opera. Um, and then maybe that's a horrible gift for some people. But anyway, uh, gifts to the movies or gifts to whatever. And, and then you go, you're the one going, not the gift giver. So Jesus doesn't need salvation. He's perfect. So we conquer our enemies because Jesus, of course, conquered them for us. But we're the ones who get the benefit. So I think that's a part we miss. We just think Jesus is doing all this work on our behalf, behind the scenes, behind the curtains. And then one day he'll show back up and take us to heaven. But I, I don't think that's right. I think what he's telling the Laodiceans uh, the, the Ladio here and, and us across time and space is that we're the ones who experience the good works he gives us to do. We're the ones who experience the conquering that he brings. Um, yeah, we're involved. It, not in a in a uh, a way that contributes to our salvation, but just in a way that, uh, yeah, he, he's doing this for us to live out. You know, what a joy that is. I think of Hebrews chapter 12, where the author admonishes the his, uh, his hearers and also us to cast off everything which would hinder our running. And as Jesus ran, now you also run, as it were. He scorned the cross. He scorned temptation. He scorned everything that the cross and men would throw at him. Because he had the joy set before him, he was looking forward to that. And the Laodiceans are, and we also, are encouraged to, to battle, to run, to endure because of the joy set before us, uh, to participate in Christ's eternal reign, to be on the throne. That's magnificent, to, to be restored to the image that Adam threw away, Christ uh, has waiting for us. In its fullness. It, it, it really is. And that's where we're going to have to end it, just on that image. But I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Stuart Crown, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church of Palo Alto, California, and at least part-time host of this show. <laughs> Thanks for filling <laughs> it at the beginning, brother. Uh, God's peace be with all of you. Thank you, brother. I told uh, my predecessor, Brady Finner, and actually during the show that uh, you uh, had to jump in, and he just spoke very highly of you and said, I... I I was uh, fortunate to have you as a guest, and I agree. Hey, tomorrow, uh, Roger Mullet takes us, Pastor Roger Mullet takes us through chapter four as we're given a glimpse of heaven's throne room. Uh, in this section, John is taken up in the spirit to witness the awe inspiring throne room of God. 24 elders, four living creatures, worship resounding as they proclaim God's holiness and eternal glory. That's going to be a sight to hear about tomorrow. Also, don't forget that this Friday is our free text, first Friday episode. The Reverend Philip Fishaber will join us to talk about relics. Well, when we planned the show, it was just the hot topic at the moment, the Shroud of Turin, but I knew it would probably be out of the news cycle by the time we get it. So we are going to talk about Turin and a bunch of other things that have to do with relics, right? Are these holy or are they a hoax? We'll talk about it. More on that special episode, Holy Heirlooms or Hollow Hype. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word.